Welcome to Case Flash, brought to you by the CBA Family Law Section. I'm Sam Schoonmaker. Today's Case Flash addresses the litigation privilege, absolute immunity, and the Supreme Court decision in Sims v. Seaman. First, the basic allegations. This is a tort action in which Robert Sims alleged fraud and intentional infliction of emotional distress by his ex-wife and her attorneys. The basic allegation is that Donna Sims received notice that she would inherit a large sum of money and that her attorneys did not bring the inheritance to the attention of the trial court or the appellate court. The timing and procedural posture of the case is much more complex than that, but that is the basic allegation. The trial court struck the fraud claim and the intentional uh, infliction of emotional distress claim, reasoning that they were barred by the doctrine of absolute immunity. Mr. Sims appealed. The appellate court affirmed the trial court decision in a two-to-one decision. The Supreme Court granted certification on the following issue. Did the appellate court properly determine the claims of fraud and intentional infliction of emotional distress brought against attorneys for conduct that occurred during judicial proceedings were barred as a matter of law by the doctrine of absolute immunity? A four-justice majority affirmed the trial court. One justice concurred in the result, one justice dissented. Uh, Judge Gordon, what is the litigation privilege and why does it exist? Well, I think that um, if people really want to know what that privilege is in great detail, they will find in Justice Zarella's uh, opinion um, an exhaustive uh, explanation both I think on uh, well and more than both it, it, he gives a historical uh, geographical and jurisdictional uh, uh, survey really of this idea that there is and has been since I think he says the Norman conquest um, a absolute privilege for the statements of counsel uh, uh, during the during a, a, a proceeding um, in order to uh, allow for the um, uh, zealous advocacy by a client, uh, by a lawyer on behalf of their client. And um, there are different uh, types of absolute immunity. The ones that we, I think we are not subject of this are uh, for defamation uh, inside of a courtroom or a court proceeding. Statements are made are not actionable for, for defamation. And here he's talking about the privilege uh, even for uh, fraud. Um, and uh, which makes it pretty controversial, uh, I think, because fraud among counsel is not something that we would want to condone. Uh, Attorney Palmer, what's the difference between an absolute privilege and a limited privilege? An absolute privilege is, is exactly how it sounds, that there is no lawsuit that will lie based on the, uh, on the, on the claim. Uh, in a limited uh, immunity uh, situation, uh, the person entitled to immunity is entitled to immunity only to the extent that it protects the scope of his duties as a lawyer. So in other words, in my analysis, fraud would be outside of that because fraud, you're actually willfully doing something outside the context of being a lawyer. You're an active participant in, in creating some fraud either on the other side or on the court. So I would, I would distinguish that as being outside the scope of the, the, what's necessary for the person's duties. Okay. Uh, Judge Gordon, what did the uh, majority find here, though? I think that, the, um, that Justice Zarella, writing for the majority, found that, um, it, that there was no reason to throw aside, I think, what he would have called hundreds of years of uh, legal precedent that gave absolute immunity in these circumstances to a lawyer representing uh, a client. And it didn't seem to me that he was necessarily doing that easily, but he was doing it with great conviction in his writing. Um, and uh, he talked about uh, the balancing test that you have on the one hand conduct, which none of us would want to say was all right, balanced against um, a lawyer having to um, be um, uh, being more circumspect, to behave differently, to speak differently, to conduct himself differently in the course of a proceeding, not necessarily because he was participating in the fraud, but, but because he could be, it could be alleged 
that he was doing that. And he wanted to make sure that lawyers would be free to zealously represent their clients without fear of suit based on somebody else's supposition about their conduct. Yeah, so this is about zealous representation by uh, attorneys and also the, um, preserving the administration of justice by preserving access to the courts by the clients. It, absolutely, because you didn't want to, you didn't want lawyers caught in a, in a position where their uh, zealous advocacy was um, then um, attacked as being part of some fraud on the court or fraud on the other party. Um, uh, and even if they were vindicated, it had a chilling effect on the conduct of the, of the lawyer. Now, Attorney Palmer, the dissent and the concurring opinions had a different uh, view on this. Well, actually, the, the concurring, the concurrence and the dissent actually agreed on most of, of their analysis. They, they disagreed on the result, but they agreed that limited, li that limited immunity would be appropriate un under uh, the circumstances of fraud. Um, because it goes outside the, the context of what the lawyer does. What they both propose, both Justice Palmer in his dissent and Justice Evely in his concurrence, is that we, not every case would be subject to an allegation of fraud by the attorney. It would only be those cases where either a motion for sanctions was filed in the trial court and the trial court found that there was fraud by the attorney, or if there was a grievance filed against the attorney and the grievance panel found that the allegation of fraud was sustained. So it's, it's not every case would be opened up to such an allegation. Where Justice Evely and Justice uh, Palmer disagree is that Justice Evely uh, believes that since there was no motion for sanctions or grievance filed in this case, he would concur in the, in the ultimate result that it didn't set forth a cause of action. Justice Palmer would send it back to the trial court uh, so that there could be a finding as to whether or not the lawyer committed fraud in the underlying action or to give Mr. Uh, Mr. Sims an opportunity to file a grievance. Okay. So, so what are some of the safeguards? The majority talks a lot about safeguards against this kind of conduct by attorneys. What are the kind of safeguards was the majority discussing? Well, I, I think that the majority is talking about the safeguards that we all see as governing attorney misconduct in general. Uh, the ability to file motions for sanctions or refer people to the grievance committee or file grievance complaints. Um, and uh, that that's where this kind of conduct appropriately belongs, but not in a separate uh, cause of, of action um, that would be allowable or created. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the ones that we most commonly see, grievance committee sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, attorney Palmer, when, you're, when an attorney is in a case, is it always clear uh, whether or not there's been, uh, whether a client is asking an attorney to commit fraud, are the facts always clear to an attorney? I would suggest that they're very rarely clear to the attorney because the attorney wasn't there. I mean, ultimately, you're relying mostly on what your client tells you and on what the witnesses tell you. So, to the extent that you have, you believe your client, then you know the attorney. Is can only believe the papers are in front of him and what his client tells him what the witnesses say. So based on that, you know, I don't, I don't think you can ever guarantee that what's coming out is the truth. And in fact, where the client is participating in the fraud and the attorney doesn't, our law does provide that, you know, in, in terms of the attorney-client privilege, the privilege goes away. There, we have a crime-fraud exception. And it doesn't necessarily have to be criminal fraud. It could be civil fraud to get around the crime-fraud exception as well. So we do carve out fraud in some areas, but in this area, uh, the majority has taken an absolute view. I think Justice Evely's uh, position really is, is, is a more balanced approach to this. We're, we're carving out cases and we're carving them out even further as to which cases are going to go forward. So in Justice Evely's view, there, there would be a possibility to bring a fraud case after there's been a finding by a grievance committee or by a or on a, a motion for sanctions, there's that first step exactly. There, there's there's almost a, a vetting process, or you know what, in some some realms would be a probable cause hearing, uh, to make a determination about whether whether fraud was committed by the attorney. Uh, Judge Gordon, what would you think would happen uh, if that were the rule? I think that we would be seeing um, if people thought 
that there were monetary damages available at the end of a process, I think we'd see more people using the, perhaps using the process. I mean, I, I think that the hardest thing about this uh, for me is that in, I, I can't, I can't think of a, of, a, of a time when I even thought that this was happening in my 23 years on the bench. And I think all of us would agree it's a pretty rare occurrence, at least if discovered. And the solution, for instance, that's being offered is, um, I kind of think in some ways it's a solution in search of a problem. It's more of a, a more of a bad press idea that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be protecting lawyers who are committing fraud in the course of uh, representing people. And we could all agree with that if it weren't for the fact that there would be a huge chilling effect on people for fear of the fraud being claimed. And that's the injury in and of itself. It's the fraud being claimed. Um, and uh, uh, the time and effort in terms of trying to prove that you didn't do something. But how, how does the victim of the fraud be made whole through a motion for sanctions or a grievance? And in this case, it was the adversary client who claimed he was out several hundred thousand dollars in legal fees because of the fraud committed by the attorney on the other side. If it was the attorney's client, then the attorney's client clearly can sue his attorney for committing fraud because that's that goes to the scope of his representation. But when it's the other side, what remedy does he have to get his $400,000 in legal fees back? Well, he doesn't have a remedy under this decision to get his $400,000 back. One could say that if we really thought this was a problem and we thought it was grievable um, or there was a finding of sanctions, you could expand the scope of the attorney's security fund and make these types of things recoverable through that and let that commission kind of deal with it, I suppose, which would take it outside of a lawsuit and discovery and, um, I mean, you could see this being used as a weapon in tremendous ways if you were actually allowed to bring the suit, I but, think. But without, without that fund, the, the, again, the adversary client is without remedy. Right, and I guess that I don't think anybody is arguing that that's a perfect result, but in a balancing test of the interest, what Justice Sorella is saying is better that than a chilling effect on the adversary proceedings in the courtroom. Most lawyers are inherently honest, and in fact, if, if, a, if a client, my experience is, is that if a client discloses to an attorney that, that he's about to commit a fraud, the attorney is proactive in, in trying to avoid that either by you know, telling the client not to or by eventually moving to withdraw because he doesn't want to participate in it. Yeah. It, it's, a real con it's a real conundrum in a, in a system in which we have open access to the court with the American rule and not the British rule of the loser pays. And, you know, we have, uh, I mean, there are any number of litigants who are unhappy because they think the other side is causing, costing them an awful lot of money for their non-fraudulent conduct, but their litigious conduct, and they, there's there's no remedy. Fraud is a different level that maybe there should be some remedy for within the system absent a lawsuit. Um, and, and I'm not sure how this all works in the sanctions level. I can understand how it would work on the grievance level, but I mean, when do the sanctions get raised? Does it stop the trial? Does it create a conflict between the attorney and the client? I mean, it's really kind of a, you know, a rat's nest of questions. This case is essentially a restatement of uh, many hundreds of years of case law, but raises it in a way that's very compelling uh, and raises the public policy interests uh, on both sides of this debate in a, uh, in a very compelling way. Thank you for listening to Case Flash.